unseen assassin that surrounds us. Over the centuries, it has slain millions. Its mysteries have been studied by shaman and scientist alike. And today, it may hold the key for curing some of mankind's most serious afflictions. Now, Poison on Modern Marvels. Tokyo, Japan, 1995. A noxious gas overcomes riders on the city's subway. Thousands are panicked, hundreds injured. Twelve people die. The culprit? A deadly poison called sarin has been released by a fanatical cult on the unsuspecting masses. Sarin is a, we call it a nerve agent, and it causes uh, the body to basically drown in its own fluids. People get sweating, they get diarrhea, vomiting, the lungs fill up with fluids, and generally death from a nerve agent is a respiratory death. It's nasty, and it's very toxic. Washington, D.C., 2001. The United States Senate building is rapidly evacuated. There has been an attack on this austere chamber. The weapon this time? Another lethal toxin. Highly refined anthrax spores sent by mail into the building. Inhalational anthrax leads to hemorrhage and then ultimately a, a respiratory uh, illness that progresses to death. And the spores are so lethal that it's estimated it only takes maybe uh, 25 to 50 spores uh, of weapons grade anthrax to kill you. Ukraine 2004. In the midst of the heated campaign for president, opposition leader Viktor Yushchenko falls mysteriously ill after dining with the head of his country's security service. He suffers from excruciating back pain, pancreatitis, and paralysis. Most obviously, the unknown illness ravages his face, making it almost unrecognizable. Tests done in an Austrian clinic prove that Yushchenko had been poisoned with dioxin, a potent chemical carcinogen. Dioxin is a byproduct of herbicide manufacturing. Dioxin exposure can also cause kidney and liver damage, even death. Although expected to survive, Yushchenko's future is as yet unknown. In the 21st century, poisons still inspire fear and remain potent weapons. But as with these lethal examples, an invisible gas, microscopic spores, and a chemical waste product, they seem to come in countless forms. What is it then that constitutes a true poison? Well, poison is a substance that has uh, an adverse effect on a human or an animal, for, for that matter. And it could be a variety of, of different types of substances. The poisons in nature come from usually the plant world, the animal world, or the mineral world. So for plants, we have such things as the vitalis, belladonna, even poison ivy. From the animal world, we have things like the venomous creatures, the snakes, the spiders. We have stinging insects like bees and wasps and hornets. And in the uh, mineral world, typically it's the elemental poisons like arsenic or thallium. And then we have the chemical elements made by man, which includes cyanide and many of the rodenticides. It could be a medication. Uh, it could be a gas that's produced, uh, like a carbon monoxide. The key that defines a poison is the dose. At a certain dose, practically everything can be poisonous. Some toxins require very tiny amounts, uh, such as a botulinum toxin, the most uh, toxic or poisonous substance uh, known to man. Uh, very, very minute amounts uh, can be deadly. Uh, but in larger amounts, even uh, table salt, for instance, is poisonous. The lethal actions of poisons can be as wide-ranging as the makeup of the poisons themselves. Uh, poisons can be ingested, they can be inhaled, uh, they can be absorbed through the skin, and uh, once in the body, uh, they can affect, again, different organs or systems. Uh, if they work on a tissue level, if they cause destruction of the tissues, then you have effect uh, on the organs. Uh, once the organs start to die, then the person can die. Uh, so it's very specific as to the substance and how it acts. Think of the poison molecule as a chemical monkey wrench. We throw it into the human body, it begins to change all of the body chemistry, therefore it has the bad effect. The knowledge and use of poisons goes all the way back to prehistory. 
Boy, how did man first find the poison? I don't know, except it seems like it must have taken a long time. We have to go back several hundred thousand years. Well, ancient societies uh, you know, clearly re relied upon the land. I think uh, over the years through a lot of uh, experimentation with what was tasty and what uh, was foul tasting, uh, one discovered uh, problems with a variety of, uh, of substances which, had, uh, which caused adverse effects. Our ancestors also witnessed the lethal power of poisons in the animal kingdom, which must have inspired both great fear and curiosity. These toxins are found in the highly evolved fluid called venom. A venom is uh, actually a difficult thing to define, but it's usually uh, made up of a variety of uh, interesting proteins and things that have different physiological effects on what these animals sting or bite. To our ancestors, even the tiniest of venomous animals could deliver painful stings and bites. These are the arthropods, which include insects and spiders. There's about 38,000 different kinds or species of spider in the world. Of those 38,000, there is anywhere from 30 to 40 that are considered potentially dangerous by the World Health Organization. Unlike other arthropods, spiders deliver their venom through biting. They use their mouth parts, which are actually modified appendages, which we refer to as chelicerae, but that are turned into sharp pointed things that we refer to commonly as fangs. The venom of a spider is produced by venom glands. These uh, reservoirs and glands are closely associated with their fangs or their mouth parts just inside their head. When a spider does bite, venom flows through the hollowed out portion of the fang into the prey item and uh, it's as easy as pie. The spider's close relation, the scorpion, has a vastly different way of envenomating their prey. Scorpions do not inject their venom by biting. They use an additional structure at the end of a long tail called a telson with a nice barb at the end, and we refer to it as a stinger. There's a poison sac associated with that stinger, and they use that tail to bend sort of around and over their body and uh, sting their prey item. The scorpion's sting has long been known for its potency. In 198 AD, the citizens of the city of Hatra used clay pots filled with scorpions and shot by catapult as weapons against the invading Roman forces. The Romans were driven away by this most unlikely of weapons. Another venomous arthropod is the bizarre looking centipede. Centipedes are all predatory and to help them catch their prey items they have an associated venom and, and uh, uh, injection apparatus and that injection apparatus, their stingers, are really modified front legs called kelepeds and they hold them up very close to their head. People will refer to the a, attack of a centipede, if you will, as a centipede bite. However, technically speaking, the injection of venom from a centipede is not a bite, it's a sting because it's not the mouth parts doing it. The arthropods most people associate with painful stings are of the hymenoptera order, which includes bees and wasps. When most people are thinking of bees and wasps, they're actually thinking of some of the very highly uh, evolved forms of wasp. Uh, the way that these wasps and bees inject their venom is with a stinger at the rear end, at the end of the abdomen, and it's a small little structure that most people actually can't really see. The stinger appears here as a hair-like structure protruding from the abdomen of this wingless wasp. And when they want to sting, out it comes and in it goes. While the power of these tiny creatures must have surprised and intrigued our ancestors, they didn't have to look far to find even larger and more formidable venomous animals. Besides spiders, scorpions are the arthropods with the most human envenomations per year recording nearly 15,000 in 2003. Poison will return on Modern Marvels. One group of animals must have stood out to our ancestors because of their unique appearance as well as their lightning fast strikes, the snakes. But in reality, only a fraction of the snake population is venomous. There are approximately 2,000 species of snakes throughout the world and approximately a quarter of those do have venom. Snake venom, like that of other animals, is classified by the part of the body it attacks. Some snakes, like pit vipers, possess hematoxic venom, which targets the circulatory and lymph systems. Most of the snakes that we see in North America are pit vipers. 
and they cause destruction of blood vessels, uh, necrosis or dying of tissue locally. So you have lots of pain, lots of swelling, and what will happen is in some cases you have such internal bleeding to such an extent that your heart just can't keep up with the circulation. Another family of snakes, the elapids, possess lethal neurotoxic venom. This causes far less pain than hemotoxic venom, but instead directly attacks the central nervous system. And you do not have symptoms sometimes up to about six hours after the bite, and all of a sudden you have uh, big respiratory problems very fast. That would cause, could cause a fatality by basically shutting down your, your breathing and your heart. Knowledge of these venom types may have been the reason that this elapid, the African cobra, was used to perform one of history's most famous suicides. This is supposedly the asp that Cleopatra used to commit suicide with. If you're going to commit suicide by snake bite, this would not be a bad choice. It wouldn't be near as painful as some of the other guys. Regardless which type of poison they possess, all venomous snakes share a unique mechanism for injecting it into their victims. When a venomous reptile strikes its prey, what it does is by muscular contraction, it forces venom from the venom glands to the oviducts, to the fangs, out the orifice, and into the animal. Does the snake world have a poison champ? One species that is considered the most dangerous? There's several. Uh, there's the black mamba from Africa, which is a large elapid uh, with short fixed fangs, neurotoxic venom. Another very dangerous snake is called a taipan from Australia and New Guinea. Once again, it's a very large snake, which is about 14 feet in length. It has the neurotoxic uh, venom, and it's known for multiple bites. The fatality rate from a bite of these snakes is nearly 50%, and a fatal dose of their powerful neurotoxic venom is astonishingly small. With the taipan, probably a very small amount, probably like five milligrams injected, uh, could prove fatal to a person. Along with snakes, there are other reptiles, like lizards and amphibians that possess the deadly kiss of poison. There are only two types of venomous lizards in the world, and it's the Mexican beetle lizard and the Gila monster, which is a native to the United States, which is found primarily in Arizona. The Gila's mostly neurotoxic venom can also produce an uncharacteristic amount of pain and is delivered in a unique fashion. The venom and the venom apparatus of the venomous lizards are quite a bit different from snakes. They have saliva glands that have evolved into having some toxin, and these are located in the bottom of the jaw. And attached to these venom glands are some enlarged teeth, and these teeth actually have a groove on the side, and this venom and the saliva will stick into these grooves, and then the lizard will bite and chew. The most remarkable looking of the venomous amphibians are the brightly hued poison dart frogs. Uh, a lot of amphibians do have a very strong toxin throughout their body. In most cases, they just make the animal very bad tasting, so an animal will, will let them go. Uh, it's evolved quite a bit to a more dangerous toxin, and some of the animals, like the little poison dart frogs, are found in Central and South America. And these have extremely toxic venom and these are actually the the frogs that the natives use to tip their poison darts with and this is a very strong uh, neurotoxic secretion and they will use it to uh, shoot a monkey in a tree for instance and and uh, it'll knock that monkey right out of the tree in a, in a couple minutes even when our ancestors entered the waters of the oceans and rivers they came across venomous creatures but most of these poison carriers are shy and rarely aggressive. They all have venom basically because they're protecting themselves. In most cases, they're very slow moving. Um, if a predator approaches them, they really don't have the speed to swim away and escape this predator. Most venomous fish are as unique looking as they are toxic. There are three primary groups of fishes that are venomous, and those are lion fishes, scorpion fishes, and the most venomous fish of all, the stonefish. In all of these groups of fishes, first 11 to 17 spines of that dorsal fin is where most of the venom is located. There are two grooves that run up the side of the spines, and each spine is covered with a thin sheath. 
when the spine is injected into the victim, basically the sheath is broken and due to the pressure on that spine, the venom is released from the glands and into the victim. Like most painful hematoxic venoms, an envenomation from any of these creatures will cause an immediate reaction. The venom actually causes a great deal of pain. In most cases, uh, reported cases involving humans, it's the excruciating pain and the swelling that's associated with its venom. Other venomous sea dwellers actively seek out their prey. Sea snakes, they actually use the venom to capture and immobilize their prey. Sea snakes have long fired our imaginations. They are thought to be the real animals behind the ancient legends of sea serpents. Real sea snakes inhabit warm tropical waters and are both more prevalent and more venomous than most people know. Well, there are about 70 species of sea snakes and they're all venomous, but all of the sea snakes are rear fanged. So they have hollow fangs at the back of their jaw that basically they use to inject the venom into their prey. Sea snake venom is among the animal kingdom's most potent. A full envenomation of a sea snake, which is very, very rare, um, can actually cause the fatality of three full-grown humans. So they are potentially fatal. The appearance of the graceful sea jellies belies their highly toxic venom. One thing that um, is found in all of these animals are stinging cells called nematocysts. And nematocysts are like small pockets that have a coiled up barb inside of them. And when um, the stinging cell, which is found in the tentacles of the sea jellies, comes in contact with a piece of plankton or a small fish, that contact actually releases the barb of the nematocyst and injects the venom into its prey. Our ancestors must have feared the many poison-carrying creatures they encountered on land and in the sea. But that was tempered by our desire to understand and harness the power of these toxins. And learn we did. For as we evolved into social beings, our knowledge and use of poisons also grew, often with fatal results. The world's most venomous snake is a sea snake known as Hydrophis belcheri whose venom is considered at least 100 times more potent than any of its land-based cousins. Poison will return on Modern Marvels. No one knows how humans first came to learn about and utilize poisons. But it seems that as soon as we had acquired written language, we wrote about poisons. We find that the very first written records are with the Babylonians, where they're talking about an goddess named Gula, who is the mistress of charms and spells. If we move forward to ancient Egypt, we find the papyrus Ebers. This is an Egyptian uh, document uh, which dates back to approximately uh, 1500 BCE. And uh, this uh, puts together a list of substances that uh, were thought to be uh, poisonous uh, during that day, including uh, some uh, uh, plant extracts uh, such as aconitine and, and belladonna. Also uh, some uh, minerals uh, are included like arsenic and, and also uh, some uh, um, animal uh, poisons, uh, particularly the venoms uh, from uh, snakes. A deep interest in poisons continued into the flourishing society of ancient Greece, which would give the study of poisons its name. The word tox, which forms toxicology, intoxication, etc., all comes from the Greek tox, which means arrow. And it's felt that it is tied in to the use by the ancient Greeks of poisons as arrow poisons. Uh, Socrates uh, died uh, after being administered a poison hemlock, and uh, this was uh, how the Greeks administered their, their capital punishment. Poison hemlock, or conium maculatum, was a plant well known to the ancient Greeks. It contains dangerous alkaloids that affect the central nervous system. In the right concentration, Symptoms like muscle weakness will start within 20 minutes. But it probably took Socrates a few hours to die when the hemlock finally stopped his heart. The Greeks and their contemporaries also had a desire to find something that could overcome a poison's deadly objective. 
Ah, uh, Mithridates. Now, uh, there is a man who knew his toxicology. He was uh, the king of Pontus. He took small doses of poisons himself every day, hoping that he would build up uh, a resistance to them. He was one of the first to look for that, uh, that universal antidote, but ultimately he uh, succumbed to the effects of, of some of these uh, magical uh, potions himself and died. It would be under another ancient empire that the trade of poisoning for profit first began to flourish. It is in ancient Rome that we begin to see a lot of murder happening at very high social circles. There were people who were actually hired uh, to poison others, and one of the most uh, infamous examples was uh, Locusta. Oh, Locusta. She was Nero's favorite poisoner. Eventually, he uh, was involved with her in the murder of his brother Britannicus, who was a competitor for the throne. So Locusta was the secret ninja hitter of ancient Rome and she was the master of all the knowledge of poisoning. Because of the rampant use of poisons, Roman aristocrats began a tradition that would continue for hundreds of years. Food tasters. If these ill-fated servants lived after tasting the food, their masters could then indulge. With the fall of the Roman Empire and the onset of the Dark Ages, early scientific knowledge of poisons was virtually lost. But the advent of the Renaissance brought back the use of poisons with a vengeance. It was during this uh, period that uh, uh, poisoning uh, was, was rampant and, and poisoners for hire were very uh, commonplace. Uh, in fact, in Venice in the 16th century, they had the so-called uh, Council of Ten, who were essentially a syndicate offering their uh, poisoning uh, services to those who would hire them. And they would put out a price list. If you want to get rid of the Duke, it would cost you this much, or the Pope this much, etc. Well, some authors and historians have called this group the Italian School of Poisoners. We also have other poisoners in Rome, like uh, Aqua Tefana being sold by Madame Tefana. It was a water solution of arsenic who was being sold in small bottles, and she would sell it to women to go home and give to their husband with their dinner. And of course, then the husband would die, the woman would get the inheritance and move on. Madame Tefana made arsenic her favorite tool, probably because it was so difficult to detect. Arsenic is a real notorious and infamous poison uh, because it had been used uh, literally for hundreds of years uh, as a poison of choice for someone who wanted to knock off another individual. Arsenic uh, is tasteless and, and odorless and was really an ideal poison. Arsenic is an elemental metal. Mined from the earth, it has been used over the centuries in making ceramics, paint, and textiles. As a poison, it can present a confusing range of symptoms. And it's a very fascinating poison because it causes uh, many different uh, adverse effects uh, to the body. It, uh, it can cause a very vicious uh, gastroenteritis or uh, GI uh, upset, uh, similar to some infectious diseases such as cholera. But it can also uh, affect the nervous system and can cause uh, uh, weakness and, and even paralysis. Uh, and this can be something that uh, may prove fatal as well. The Renaissance also produced history's most notorious poison assassins. Among them, Lucrezia Borgia. Today, however, it seems that Lucrezia's evil reputation was merely a bad rap. Lucrezia Borgia never murdered anyone. The real killers in the family were Rodrigo Borgia, who happened to be Pope Alexander, and his son, Cesare Borgia. These were two guys that knew how to work with arsenic. You know, a lot of people would brag that they were going to have dinner tonight with the Borgias, but not many could say they had dinner last night with the Borgias. As Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia continued a Vatican tradition wherein the papacy and fatal poisonings were linked. No fewer than six of his predecessors are suspected of falling victim to poisoning. Uh, during the Renaissance, uh, of course, there was no uh, ability to uh, detect a, a poison in the body. Uh, because uh, of this uh, fact, uh, poisons were often employed uh, uh, to knock off other people for a variety of reasons. It would be the relative of another pope who would spread the practice of poisoning outside Italy. Catherine de' Medici was the niece of Pope Clement VII. She was the one who probably is credited with carrying the knowledge of poisoning from Italy to France when she married Henry II of France. In fact, everyone was so worried about her ability as a poisoner 
that he was given a rather large dowry, including a, a unicorn horn cup. During this time, it was believed that the horn of this mythical creature could neutralize any dangerous poison. And while Henry may have felt safer with his cup in hand, the knowledge Catherine carried with her spawned another poison school, this time in France. The French School of Poisoners. And here we have some famous poisoners at work in Paris. Probably the biggest known one is the Marchioness de Brinvilliers, who killed her father, her brother, and with her lover in order to gain estates. And uh, she was eventually found out and burned in Paris. By this time, knowledge of poisons included a large variety of plant poisons, especially poisonous mushrooms. This mushroom, the Amanita phalloides, or death cap, is among the most toxic and was probably used in this era. These mushrooms contain the chemicals amanitin and phalloidin, which can destroy the liver and kidneys. Only one cap will bring about vomiting, extreme abdominal pain, and can prove fatal. The modern study of poison, toxicology, can point to one man and one book as its origin. There was a gentleman who went on to become what we call the father of toxicology. His name was Matthew Joseph Bonaventure Orfila. He wrote the first book in 1814 dedicated to his research in toxicology. The name of his book was Traite de Poison, which means in English an, an exercise or dissertation upon poison. Using poisons like arsenic, opium, strong acids, and poisonous mushrooms, Orfila used a method unique to his time. He experimented on animals. So he would take arsenic, for example, and he would minister it to dogs and cats and rabbits and doves and pigeons and everything else, and he would dissect the animal. He would note what the observable signs inside looked like. That had never been done before. And really, his observations are just as valid today. By the late 1800s, America's had farms stretching from coast to coast. To keep their crops safe from rodents, farmers began using a poison, new to this country, that caused a fast and painful death. Strychnine is a compound that's isolated from a tree, actually. It's an alkaloidal compound, very bitter in taste. Strychnine uh, is also a, a very interesting poison, uh, uh, which causes extreme uh, stiffness uh, and arching of, of the back. It can interfere with, with breathing, it can cause muscle damage, and subsequently it can cause kidney damage. And it is very toxic and certainly can kill other, other mammals very readily. By the turn of the century, poisons like strychnine and other toxins, such as cleaning solutions, were commonplace in homes. These were often kept in similar containers and in close proximity to medicines. The possibility of confusion caused an obvious problem. So some regulations were passed which uh, said that these poison bottles had to have a way for the person to be able to tell that this was in fact a harmful substance. Multiple different types of bottles showed up, many with different uh, shapes like triangular uh, shapes or octagons and, and many of them had raised ridges or knobs or quilted patterns so that when someone picks up that bottle in the middle of the night they can tell by feel that that was a poison or a toxin not meant to be ingested. The outbreak of World War I brought with it a new and unprecedented use of toxins with horrific results. We probably saw our largest use of poisons in warfare during the First World War. And I don't know who fired the first shot. The Germans are credited with it at the Battle of Ypres in Belgium when they released chlorine gas on the Allied troops. Chlorine gas is a chemical that affects the lungs as well as the throat and ultimately uh, leads to a, a drowning, essentially. And pretty soon there was an escalation of chemical agents in warfare. And we have such things as chlorine, phosgene, mustard gas. They caused hundreds of thousands of casualties. It was terrible. And while the Geneva Conventions of 1925 prohibited poison gas from being used in battle during World War II, another toxic gas, which the Germans called Zyklon B, was instead used on civilians. We know it as cyanide. 
Uh, cyanide is not easily found. It's not like you go to the cyanide mine and mine it like you do gold or arsenic or something like that. It's a compound that's created. It's an organic compound. It was used uh, by the Nazis uh, during the Second World War to uh, kill uh, Jews and others in the extermination camps in, in Germany. And they chose cyanide because it's so uh, lethal. Uh, one can kill many people uh, with a relatively uh, small amount, particularly in an enclosed uh, uh, space. And uh, when that uh, gas is inhaled into your system, it's very rapidly acting. Uh, generally within about 30 seconds, you lose consciousness. Uh, within about three to five minutes, uh, you've stopped uh, breathing. And in about five to eight minutes, your heart stops and, and you expire. A decade later, during the ensuing Cold War, toxic research was kept covert. However, poisons were studied at length by both sides for use as chemical and biological weapons. Perhaps the most notorious poisoning of the Cold War occurred on a bright spring day in 1978. We go to London, where a guy working for the BBC, but a defector from Bulgaria by the name of Gorgi Markov, on his way to work one morning, gets tapped in the back of the leg with an umbrella. A little did he know at that time that he'd actually been poisoned by one of the most deadly of chemicals. That chemical was ricin. Derived by a simple process from ordinary castor beans, ricin is a fearsome and as yet incurable toxin. Ricin can cause necrosis, uh, cell death, damage to the organs like the liver, the kidneys, the spleen. It doesn't take much to, to cause death. Only after Markov's death did they detect that a tiny pellet containing ricin had been inserted into his leg. Poison seemed to surround us with a vast range of venomous animals as well as the powerful man-made poisons it was inevitable that science and medicine would form an alliance to control this deadly array nicotine with a 45 milligram lethal dose is actually more poisonous than arsenic which has a lethal dose of 200 milligrams poison will return on modern marvels During the 1940s, World War II raged across three continents. The war also spawned many scientific innovations, some of which carried an unforeseen price tag. During the war, there was uh, a real proliferation in, in the numbers of chemicals produced. Uh, there was uh, the proliferation of, of pharmaceuticals that were produced, and it became increasingly uh, difficult for for a healthcare provider or a physician uh, to uh, have uh, much knowledge about this large number of, of chemicals and drugs. During this time, one man saw the need for a new agency dedicated to controlling the dangers of all these new toxins. Uh, first Poison Control Center opened in uh, Chicago in 1953 uh, under the guidance of Dr. Edward Press. Uh, after World War II, uh, Dr. Press found that uh, there was a large number of childhood incidents that were uh, the result of poisoning exposures. So a group of medical schools uh, in the Chicago area got together and formed the first poison control center. As the result of Press's pioneering efforts, today, virtually every citizen of the United States has immediate access to a poison control center. Now we have 52 certified regional poison centers in America. Every state has access. They have the same telephone number. Poison control centers have now become the primary conduit of medical knowledge to people who have been exposed to toxins. The poison center is, is mainly an information uh, repository. Uh, we have a phone line that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Poison controls. To manage questions from the general public, questions from physicians, emergency departments and in their offices, handling specifically questions about toxic exposures. The calls received by the poison control centers have a diversity limited only by the numerous poisons people can come into contact with. Uh, in the home setting, you can find many toxic products unsecured under people's sinks, in their bathrooms, their laundry rooms, their storage uh, buildings and rooms outside. Those can range from drain cleaners, uh, floor cleaning products, furniture polishes with petroleum distillates, uh, laundry products. Outside we find car automotive products, wheel cleaners, antifreeze. We have herbicides, insecticides, many products which can be uh, highly toxic. The sheer volume of calls received only underscores just how much the poison control center's hard work is needed. Nationally, 
uh, the Association of Poison Control Centers last year received uh, almost 2.4 million exposure calls collectively. A preponderance of those calls involves the most innocent of victims. Typical patient, 50% of the time, is heavily weighted on little kids that are into getting, you know, things they find left out on the counter or under the kitchen sink. Now, generally a child will ingest only a small amount, a lick, taste, sip of any particular substance. That's not to say that there aren't substances that uh, can cause uh, significant injury in very small ingestions. Acid products, uh, drain cleaners that contain corrosives, uh, petroleum distillates that you can find in many products like uh, furniture polishes, uh, those are things that in uh, even a smaller dose can cause very significant harm or damage. Despite the advances in poison control, very few actual poison antidotes are yet available. There's not antidotes to most poisons. Uh, in most of the ingestions and exposures that we see, uh, the therapy is just very uh, supportive care. There are only about five antidotes that are going to make a life and death difference in that victim. And that's for carbon monoxide, for cyanide, for the opium kinds of products, narcotics. We have antidotes for toxic alcohols like antifreeze and methanol. We also have an uh, antidote kit for the, the chemical nerve agents. But the greatest number of specific antidotes are for animal envenomation. These anti-venoms have been made in the same manner since their inception in the 1900s. The anti-venom is actually made from horse serum in most cases. And what they will do is they will pick a certain type of venom and they will inject a horse a little at a time and slowly build up that horse's immunity. Then they will go ahead and use that horse's blood as the basis for the anti-venin. New anti-venoms now being made from sheep serum are polyvalent, meaning that they can provide immunity from the venom of many different species at once. So they will inject several different type of venoms and build up immunity to those different type of, of snakes, and that's what will be injected into the person. The future of the poison control centers involves strengthening their current role as a repository of information about toxins, as well as finding better ways of dispensing what they know. I think our future will be solidified uh, with appropriate funding and support uh, to be able to continue to do the job that we're doing, uh, keeping people out of the hospitals and, and hopefully keeping people safe. Toxicologists have always worked to free people from poison's deadly embrace. But now, researchers are asking whether these same lethal toxins may also prove to be the keys to unlocking the mysteries of our most dread diseases. Even cancer. In 2003, nearly two-thirds of all toxic exposure calls to poison control centers across the U.S. were for people 19 years old and younger. Poison will return on Modern Marvels. The road ahead in the realm of poison, like the ancient god Janus, could have two very distinct faces. One is the chilling bio and chemical terror potential in this post-9-11 environment. Well, today, uh, it doesn't take very much knowledge, uh, chemistry knowledge, to develop biological warfare agents, uh, such as anthrax or ricin, or, or even chemical agents, such as sarin, phosgene gases. And it's basically, uh, someone could mix some of these biological agent, warfare agents, in their bathtub if they wanted to. In many cases, uh, these are things that you can get your hands on every day and uh, they are often referred to uh, because of that as the poor man's atom bomb. The first step in combating potential future bioterror threats has already begun. And the federal government through a, an act of Congress called Project BioShield is now beginning to fund research to, to try to develop vaccines. So now research dollars are going into trying to develop countermeasures against all these uh, potential biological warfare or chemical warfare agents. The poisons have also recently gained another, more positive face. Science has found that some of the most deadly toxins, when controlled, can have remarkable healing powers. For example, botulism. Botulism is a, is a toxin derived from a bacteria, the uh, Clostridium botulinum. The reason why it's so uh, concerning to the federal government is that it is the, the, the most potent lethal substance known to man in a very small, um, nanogram uh, amounts 
can cause toxicity and death in a human. It stops the nerves from transmitting signals to our skeletal muscles so they don't contract. And this becomes important when you get to the muscles for breathing, the diaphragm. When that stops contracting, you don't breathe. And of course, when you don't breathe, that's not conducive to good living. But now the power of this most deadly of poisons has been harnessed. Botox is made from a type of bacteria called uh, Clostridium botulinum. It's the same bacteria that causes botulism or food poisoning. The bacteria itself has been under scientific study since the late 1800s, when it was determined that people who got sick from eating poorly processed food were actually ingesting a powerful poison. In the 1950s, ophthalmologists became interested in using the toxin to treat eye muscle disorders. Word has it that um, a husband and wife team in uh, Vancouver noticed that when um, the eye muscle problems were being treated, that uh, as a side observation, that the wrinkling between the eyebrows seemed to reduce. And so the light bulb goes on that there may be some other usages for uh, the botulinum toxin. In 2002, the FDA approved Botox to reduce wrinkling on the forehead. The bacteria grown in a confined laboratory setting is um, harvested, the bacteria is killed, and a small protein fraction of the wall of the bacteria is used to make Botox. Well, what we're trying to do with the effect of Botox is to have the small protein molecule in the injection interfere between the nerve and the muscle communication. It's very simple, you're cutting the telephone line. But Botox's future may involve more than just making wrinkles disappear. There have been reports in a number of specialties, and I've done with Botox for various reasons, all the way from uh, muscle spasm uh, in the neck uh, to esophageal dysfunction in the GI tract. There's some urologic bladder prostate issues that can be treated with Botox. So I think the reports are well over 200 different arenas that Botox has function in. The prognosis uh, for Botox in general is uh, pretty much uh, unending. Medical researchers are now looking closely at other poisons, especially animal venoms. Recently, venom from one species of snake, the southern copperhead, has shown remarkable abilities as a potential cancer fighter. Of all the many complex proteins found in this venom, one is unique. Snake venom has, is a mixture of maybe 50 or more proteins. Uh, of those 50, this one protein, contortrostatin, has the activity as an anti-tumor agent. Making a logical leap, researchers began exploring this protein's anti-cancer properties. There had been some earlier work done um, by a group uh, at a hospital in Philadelphia suggesting that there were in snake venoms some sort of component that inhibited platelet aggregation and since cancer cells have very similar proteins on their surface to those that are on the surface of platelets we reasoned that well maybe this protein would have an effect on tumors uh, tumor spread tumor invasion uh, tumor adhesion to surfaces, so we thought it might have both an anti-tumor and also an anti-angiogenic effect, and <clears throat> actually this is what we found out to be the case. So far the studies have revealed that contortrostatin has a dramatic potential. We've now looked at glioma, which is a very damaging brain tumor, we've looked at prostate cancer, we've looked at breast cancer, and we've looked at ovarian cancer. So in breast cancer, and in the other cancers that I mentioned, the evidence is very strong that this protein has a very profound anti-tumor and anti-angiogenic effect. That is, it not only inhibits the tumor cell growth and spread, but it also directly affects newly growing blood vessel cells and blocks their ability to grow into the tumor and provide nourishment for the tumor. While this remarkable success has been limited strictly to animal studies, the hope is that soon, these same results will translate into human clinical trials and that the use of animal venoms and other so-called toxins as treatments for mankind's most serious maladies will prove to be the side of poison's Janus face 
that will thrive in the future.